So I'm here today with uh, John Ivey, who is a research specialist at North Carolina A&T in the hemp department, industrial hemp. Really appreciate you uh, taking some time to talk with us. It's hot. We're in this greenhouse. It is. Uh, how hot do you keep it in here? It's about 110 degrees, something no, like that? No, no, no. We actually try to keep it down here at 85, between 80 and 90, um, but we've got the fans off to cut back on the well, noise. Well, we got the towels. Yeah. <laughs> we've got the So, uh, we so got I the apologize. It's a little warm. We'll be ready to rock and roll. Um, Sounds good. We want to have a conversation today. Uh, this whole week, there's been the conversation against smokable hemp. Mm -hmm. uh, the ban that was pushed through to the Senate uh, Bill 315, Senate Bill 315, Senate Bill 351, which would make changes to the Farm Act and group smokable hemp with marijuana, making it essentially illegal to grow. Right. Um, before we start that uh, that conversation, get mm -hmm. into it, I kind of want to know from your expertise, could you explain hemp? There's still some mystery that surrounds it, even though it has been out for a couple of years. So hemp is the cannabis plant, which is also the same thing as marijuana. So what we try to explain to people is their cousins, okay? They're very similar, except there's one major difference. The marijuana today has anywhere from 9% and upwards to 40% THC, whereas what industrial hemp is, is 0.3% THC or less. So there is absolutely zero psychoactive effect from industrial hemp. You can't get high from it. You cannot get high, no matter how much you smoke of it. It does have those medical benefits that have made it very popular, especially CBD oil. Uh, I have things that it treats. Seizures, anxiety, pain, insomnia, inflammation. These are things that afflict a lot of people, mm -hmm. and CBD oil is a lot cheaper than some of the healthcare alternatives that are currently available. This goes back for a very long time, too, correct? Correct. And I mean, um, I, think, uh, I think the best way to think about it is that you get the same medicinal effects off of CBD as you do off of medicinal marijuana without the psychoactive effect. So for those people who don't want to get high but suffer from these types of afflictions, this is a great option for them. Now, it's important to say that um, right now the, uh, the FDA has only allowed us to say that CBD does... Uh, proactively affect seizures, but we're hoping that through this pilot program and now through, uh, through it being federally legal, that we're able to continue the research to explore the opportunities and to explore the other ailments that, that uh, this industrial hemp plant actually can, can, can fix. And it's hot. Yeah, we, uh, we thought going. we should do this indoors the next it's, time. We yeah, come, we yeah. Well, around. we can do it out in the field. It's a little bit. It's a little. Yeah, it's, cool it, it's only there. 85 degrees outside. Hey, it's, only, um, it's only 78 right now. <laughs> so the um, Senate Bill 315 mm -hmm. and 352 would make smokable hemp illegal. Uh, why the push for smokable hemp? It only makes up about 1% of total profits, total market. So why is this such something worth fighting for? Right. Well, I think the biggest thing is that the farmers were told that they were allowed to explore any market that was out there. And this was a market that, it, although it's only 1%, is developing very rapidly. Um, I think uh, the, biggest, the biggest issue here is for the smokable hemp, you get a higher price premium than you do for, for oh, processable hemp. Okay. Um, so what that means is basically you're getting around $800 to $1,000 a pound for smokable hemp, mm -hmm. whereas most people who are processing only get between $35 and $60 a pound. So there's a big price premium there. The difference is most folks who are growing smokable hemp are doing it in a controlled environment, something like this, right? Something in a greenhouse or indoors, whereas the field-grown hemp is typically used for industrial hemp and for extractions. Gotcha. Uh, we, along those lines, we've seen kind of how tobacco, the industry has mm -hmm. sort of dipped. It used to be a billion dollar industry as recently in the last you know, two decades, it's fallen to under $500 million, especially yeah. North Carolina farmers buried hard. Is there a place for industrial hemp to take it over? Uh, there's some statistics I want to read out to you really quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2018, hemp market was only around $12 million. By the end of 2019, Researchers are saying of the Brightfield Group that they're expecting the market to grow to 70 million. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. enormous. It's yeah. incredible. It is. Is there a point? Is this really a alternative that's going to be able to help tobacco farmers? That's a, it's a big business. Yeah, I feel like it is. As long as we don't have too many regulations and too many roadblocks along the way, mm -hmm. um, I think that this could definitely be a valuable crop for the farmers of North Carolina. Um, it's raised differently, so the tobacco farmers would have to kind of relearn how to do production and processing, um, curing or drying. Um, but I do see, um, and I think what we're seeing is what we've heard is that worldwide this should be a $20.2 billion industry by 2020. So we see rapid growth. The one cautionary tale I'll tell everybody is that within an industry that experienced this kind of growth, 
eventually you're going to either pop or you're going to level out. So I think we won't forever see this kind of exponential growth, but I think we'll continue to see this at least over the next five to ten years. The pie is there for the taking, certainly. It is. It is. There are some interesting kind of, I would say, <coughs> stigmas uh, surrounding. Very much so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's some stigmas kind of surrounding hemp. Uh, I mean, if, if you don't mind me. Yeah, no. this. This plant, this is a hemp plant, um, it looks like marijuana. Mm -hmm. It, it smells a lot like it. Mm -hmm. what, what problems can that can that pose? Well, for it's obvious. I think the biggest problem that it poses is for law enforcement. And you know, uh, we as farmers um, and as researchers, we don't want to have to choose between our profession and law enforcement. We understand that it looks a lot like it. It smells a lot like it, which can create problems for law enforcement. Which is where this 315, the HB, uh, the House Bill Senate, or the House Senate Bill 315 and 352 came about. Was law enforcement voicing their concerns about the problems that they're going to have between deciphering between marijuana and industrial hemp. What responsibility, if any, you know, if I'm, this is just as a devil's advocate, yeah. if I'm just curious about this, I, I could just say that if I have a joint or a blunt or any sort of smokable marijuana, I could say this is hemp mm -hmm. and there aren't really any solid solutions that are widespread to determine the two. Well, Does the industry have any responsibility to help off the law enforcement kind of get that into place? Of course. I mean, I, of course. I think there we, we do have some responsibility in that, but I think also law enforcement has some responsibility at, in developing new tools to deal with new situations, which they do all the time. Um, I, d I do think, and I think it's worth noting, that the DEA has already accepted a roadside test that tests down to 1.0% THC, but that North Carolina law enforcement will not accept that. Now, they're not the only state that's participating in the uh, industrial hemp program or uh, production that doesn't agree with that. But uh, it's also important to, to note that Virginia uh, Department of Agriculture is testing now a 0.3% roadside test. So that's even more sensitive than the one that the DEA has already accepted. Um, our hope is to provide law enforcement with the correct tools so that they can continue doing their job, but so that our farmers can also become viable again. Like you said, our farmers have been taking such a tremendous hit over the past few years um, with the trade war with China, soybean prices, commodity prices, corn prices, wheat prices have all dropped. Um, most of those commodity farmers were tobacco farmers at one time and moved away from tobacco as the industry's kind of dipped, and now they're wanting to come into hemp because they see the possibility. Um, I think our lawmakers, um, sold this to our farmers as the replacement for tobacco. And going back to the House Bill 315 and 352, if you limit markets, then you're really pigeonholing them into what they can do. With tobacco, it was an expansive market. Not only was there a U.S. market, there was a worldwide market. They did not close any markets for us. And, and, and in fact, they actually expanded worldwide markets for us. And so we're hoping that that's what they, they allow this industry to do as well, open it up instead of pigeonholing us. A, ca a counter argument, or mm -hmm. an argument I would say for 352 and mm -hmm. 351, the bill that would ban the smokeful hemp, is mm -hmm. that delay the process. Give us until 2020, if I'm a lawmaker, to enact those widespread um, waste testing methods. That makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. to me. So why, why, why would you argue against that? Even well, I, I'm not arguing against that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that this conversation, I think the way that this, the, what they voted on yesterday and passed yesterday and hopefully are going to go to the Senate and House floor with was the original bill. And that has no ban on smokable flour until 2020. That allows us time to framework how we're actually going to structure this industry. Um, I think the amendments that were added on moved that date from December 1st, 2020 to December 1st, 2019. And what that effectively would do is now that everybody's planted in the field, most farmers have a business plan before they start planting. So once they plant, they've got investment in the field, investment in infrastructure, investment in equipment, investment in everything else that they've got. And there's two different markets, although that, that smokable hemp is only 1%. You actually have to trim that down and cure it, and that's a longer process. Curing technically will take two to four weeks. Now, with drying it, you don't know if you're going to process it into an extraction, CBD oil or full spectrum oil, as we call it, then you don't have to trim it. You don't have to cure it. You cut it out of the field, you dry it, and then you take it to your processor. So there's a lot of different infrastructure involved in the smokable hemp than in just the processable CBD full spectrum oils, but I think that 
you know, as a farmer, you should be allowed to pick which market you want to go in. Some people are great at growing in the field. Some people are very great greenhouse growers. We shouldn't, we shouldn't hold either one of those accountable to not go into a market just because we haven't had a full discussion about it yet. We saw in Raleigh, outside of Raleigh, somebody was arrested um, for having smoking hemp, but mm -hmm. the officer couldn't tell the difference between marijuana and hemp. Yeah. It's worth it still, to me, in, in my opinion, to pause and wait. And mm -hmm. you're saying, even with that, yes, it's important to go ahead and make sure that all those regulations in place, but don't, don't enact enact these regulations. Am I getting this correct? Well, I think what it is, is I think we need to have a conversation about these regulations, right? I don't think we need to jump the gun because even though that's 1% of the market, we have a large number of farmers who that is their business model. So if you immediately cut that out, well, then they have no market. So then they've got to change their business plan. Now, my only problem with that is that it waited until June. Have we had this conversation in November, December, or over the previous three years that we've been in the pilot program, then we could have worked through these issues. To bring it to the forefront and just say there's no other option, this is it, this is the way it's got to be, to me is very, very abrupt ending to what could be a very valuable experience and a very valuable market and very viable income for a lot of these small farms. Um, you know, one of the things that we do at a and is we work with small family farms. A lot of these people don't have the acreage to compete with big tobacco. Mm -hmm. Having this greenhouse kind of niche market for smokable hemp is an opportunity for them to actually become economically viable for a few years. And these are the types of things that we want to have the conversation so that we can flush it all out. Just some questions that I have yeah. before we wrap up. You've been great. I really no worries. Your time again. Just some common kind of ideas. Can you drive while you're on hemp or while you're uh, on CBD oil? Well, so, I mean, I think that's a question that's not, I, I, I'm probably not qualified to answer. Okay. If, you want, if you want my opinion, though, there's no psychoactive effect. Okay. So um, the way I understand the law, and I'm not a lawyer, so let me preface that. I'm just a researcher. But uh, the way I understand the law is you have to be under the influence that psychoactively affects you. Alcohol, okay. um, marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine. Those things actually affect your, process, your mental processes. Industrial hemp has such a low percentage of THC that it's not psychoactive. Okay. Now, I understand the law enforcement side of this is that if you're driving down the road smoking a CBD joint or cigarette, they can't tell if it's marijuana or not. Right. And we don't want to hinder law enforcement. We don't want to hinder our farmers. This is the conversation that all we're asking for is just having enough time to let's have this open, honest conversation with each other because I don't think anybody should have to choose between law enforcement and farmers. I thank a farmer three times a day when I eat. And right now I'm giving you an interview. My house is not being broken into because of law enforcement. So I, I don't want to have to choose. I think that if we are allowed to have a conversation, we can all come to some kind of common ground. John Ivey, Research Specialist at North Carolina AT&T, literally on the hot seat today with us sweating it out. Really appreciate your time. Chris, thank you, buddy. Come let's back anytime. Some, let's go get some air conditioning. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Whew, I'm going to kick these fans back on.